Доброго дня, шановні. Other part, and I'm grateful to our colleagues who joined us today in the studio of UCMC. We start. The topic of forced disappearances is a painful, difficult topic. Our organization is dealing with this topic from the very start of the relation of such facts on the occupied Crimea. Our research is the second research. The first one was dedicated to forced disappearances starting 2014-2017 and covered all instances of forced disappearances, including those after which people were found in places of detention or found dead, or for example, they were extradited and uh, also this report is dedicated to 15 cases of forced disappearances of those people who are now missing and uh, we try to tell more broadly about those people to tell about violations of international law and to tell about the situation on the whole uh, that happened that um, from the start of the occupation, and we hold actions to support members of forced disappearance, uh, um, family members of um, victims of forced disappearance, and we had the 52nd uh, action, and we started it after Irene Bagram Gimov went missing, and we tried to find support, and we hold these actions each month, and we won't stop until we find those people and efficient investigation should be launched. The first topic we want to cover is the situation with the forced disappearances after occupation started and the um, story is about families. We start this presentation and report and uh, discussion with introductory word and uh, the stories of families and we are uh, grateful to those who joined us. I uh, welcome here Abdur Rashid Parav. Uh, he is the father of um, uh, um, Ilyama uh, Japarov. And uh, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker to tell about the situation, about the feelings, and how this all happened. Abdur Rashid Japarov is given the floor. When Russians entered Crimea, there was chaos. We couldn't understand what was going on. People started to disappear, but we didn't know what will happen next and that uh, there will be uh, a system in this. And some people were found alive, others were dead. There were many contradictions. And uh, human rights experts, they estimated uh, this uh, data about people differently. Now we know the data. And uh, in my case, this was September after Sherman Danov, uh, Siran, Zaydinov, and before them there were several people. This was September 2014, 20, um, uh, 7th of September. Uh, there were guests in our house and a car. Uh, 
started to signal and uh, um, I went out and uh, a person said that uh, my um, son and uh, nephew were kidnapped and um, <clears throat> if something happens to anyone else you know what to do and when something happens to you you do not know what to do and uh, I uh, uh, addressed uh, my friends and I addressed SBU and uh, police uh, and uh, there was chaos and then the case was started and uh, we were interrogated as people who are involved in the crime not as witnesses this happens to me and with my sister uh, uh, of, and uh, uh, also we are grateful to the witness who provided information to us uh, and uh, uh, then um, he was condemned in accordance with uh, some um, article uh, by Kerchinsky court. Now he is afraid to come here. He is afraid uh, to be here. Uh, so there was some sort of investigation, but uh, they tried to cover up. They invited some witnesses, some neighbors. Uh, we know here each uh, we know uh, people here uh, this is a small place and uh, they try to threaten people they try to make them uh, to forget this uh, incidents uh, and uh, we try to find some um, information about uh, investigation and about what is going on and uh, we believe that uh, FSB controls every step, every movement, and uh, they coordinated these actions. Uh, and uh, when my son was kidnapped, it was a Volkswagen transporter, and this information, uh, and uh, so also prior cars and others, many people witnessed this event, and one person provided information about uh, uh, this incident to us. Six and a half years passed since then, about this period of time. Maybe we cannot speak about it because uh, only those people who suffered know uh, what uh, the situation is like. So uh, these are difficult events. I try to do something about this case for people it is really difficult to face such situations i do not know how people cope how it is difficult even to speak about all this i understand those who face such situation uh, families uh, relatives parents also uh, after this was there was some pause in, uh, in the um, 14th of December, there was uh, the meeting in Moscow, and uh, uh, the information was provided about what happened with my children. And uh, Putin said that uh, uh, he didn't know about it, and uh, this should not happen. And for some time, um, uh, and. Uh, on the 15th of December 2015, Ruslan Ganiev and uh, uh, again uh, they were uh, 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 kidnapped, and then uh, and then Elvira Ibrahimov was kidnapped, uh, and there are a number of cases. Our group dealt with the, these cases. Uh, sometimes uh, we do not know about situ the situation. Terehov was kidnapped, but he had difficult situation in his family, and um, he didn't have ma many friends. And there was only one friend who called uh, him, and uh, then uh, we understand that there are many people who were kidnapped, but no one knows about it because some people just uh, leave the territory so no one knows where these people are. Uh, also investigative bodies, they provide uh, 
pour les prepared vers uh, versions ab uh, about what happened. They said that they went to Donbass to fight or to Syria. Uh, so uh, they have, uh, they do not have proper grounds. Uh, so we hope that uh, we won't have such disappearances in the future, such kidnappings in the future. But uh, one of the leaders of um, the um, investigative committee said that this is a common case, this disappearances of people, and we should get accustomed to this. And so we may uh, expect a worsening of the situation. So things are like this, what I can tell you. And uh, we didn't expect uh, a lot from this investigation carried out by Russia, but Ukraine also uh, doesn't deal with these issues properly. Only uh, human rights defenders and activists deal with it, and those bodies who should deal with these cases, they uh, uh, do not do anything uh, useful. We cannot see this that could set something that can satisfy us concerning these cases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Larissa, please join us. We give you the floor. Cannot hear her. Turn on the mic. Good afternoon. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon. I will continue this hard topic. Our son went missing on the 26th of May 2014 on Monday. This was the day after elections. Uh, he called us, he spoke with me and his father, and everything was like usual. And uh, he had to um, uh, meet his child um, at school, but uh, he went missing and in one uh, in one day, our daughter called and she said that our son um, went missing and uh, starting Monday he went missing and no uh, signs uh, that um, he is um, available. So um, our children didn't provide us with information what uh, they do there, but we knew that Timur uh, disagreed with the occupation of Crimea by Russia, and he supported and provided humanitarian help to uh, those who participated in uh, resistance to occupation. At the start, there was information that uh, um, the um, uh, self-defense tried to um, to dismantle uh, at, at their channel. Uh, Timur organized the resistance uh, to preserve this work of the channel. And uh, um, also they participated in pickets near military bases in order to prevent uh, um, the conflict to the self-defense. And also there were meetings uh, uh, against occupation, and uh, uh, Timur met other guys. Uh, um, he is a Protestant priest, and uh, together uh, they uh, gathered and they made plan to uh, peacefully resist uh, ongoing occupation. My children didn't accept uh, this uh, Russian occupation, and uh, uh, we are from Tatarstan. 
we lived there, and then we came here in uh, 1986, and our children were born in Russia, in Tatarstan, but we lived here, and Ukraine is our home, and everyone recognized this, and we didn't speak Ukrainian, but our children, they studied in Ukrainian school, and uh, they studied in the uh, a boarding school in the city because we live in village and they uh, spoke Ukrainian perfectly and they were really real Ukrainians uh, in, uh, uh, and um, they spoke Ukrainian even at home and when we are asked why Timur uh, now has this pro-Ukrainian position he was born in Russia but he lived all his life uh, uh, here, Ukraine is our home, and my children believe so, and I believe that this is the right position. And uh, the guys, they tried to peacefully oppose, uh, because no one knew the seriousness of the situation, and now it looks uh, uh, after this uh, six and a half years that this was a terrible dream, and uh, today we do not even want to believe what happened and what happened and during the meetings Timur was always at the front line and um, he had a uh, um, um, sign with the um, um, a symbol of Ukraine and self-defense, uh, they didn't like it. Uh, self-defense uh, militants, they came up, they threatened uh, them and uh, uh, made video footage. And uh, um, Timur and uh, uh, our daughter, they uh, uh, were at the railway station. They were waiting for the Lviv train and self-defense fighters came up to him and they, uh, he, they knew him and they said directly, go to your um, uh, Bandera land. And the Timur said that, uh, uh, yes, I'm going uh, by this train, but I want to visit my parents in Kherson Oblast and I will come back for sure. So he returned and uh, on the 26th of May, before lunch, starting 10.30 till noon uh, in this period of time, he went missing. When we got information about this, we hope that this is some misunderstanding and uh, we will see him in several days, but we were uh, we really worried and we started to um, um, contact uh, our daughter and daughter started to address different state bodies and uh, uh, filed some requests about him, and Russia started investigation concerning uh, the case that a person went missing. And uh, I also addressed uh, my acquaintances in the prosecutor's general office because it was difficult for me to file the case here in Ukraine. And we uh, addressed all the institutions and uh, moral support was provided to us uh, by the heads of uh, Mejlis, uh, Mustafa Dremilev, Rifat Chubarov. They uh, supported us morally. We hoped for something. There was some information that in uh, June, Sernan and Timur, they were sent to the mainland, and we contacted Russian human rights, as Zvita and Valery Barshov, that uh, they helped us uh, to find uh, our son, uh, to find him in places of uh, detention, but we couldn't uh, find any traces of our children. And in mainland, uh, we were helped, and and she continues to help us. This is a friend of our family, a lawyer, Evgenia Zakrievskaya, helped us. And uh, from the very first day of our cooperation with Victoria, many investigators had changed, uh, and uh, the 
her son uh, police uh, department and uh, investigators in the prosecutor's office all those uh, uh, units were I involved in the investigation due to uh, Evgenia Zakrevska. Uh, by the way, I cannot understand the why it is so difficult to initiate and to push the investigation while our children, our guys, they re risked their lives uh, standing for the interests of Ukraine in Crimea. Uh, now, in mainland Ukraine, uh, the uh, official agencies, uh, they are not so much eager to investigate the forced disappearances of our um, when on April uh, 1st, the uh, uh, Mariners Brigade uh, crossed Paravalne, uh, we established uh, uh, um, uh, contacts with them and we got moral support. Uh, later on, we submitted the case to the European Court uh, uh, on Human Rights uh, for inefficient investigation both in, in the Ukraine and in Russia. Andrei Yakovlev, our current lawyer, um, in this case uh, uh, contributes a lot of effort, but unfortunately there is no results. So, um, after disappearance of uh, even Irina Ebregimov, uh, some activists started uh, the um, uh, action uh, in front of the Russian embassy here in Kiev uh, um, uh, to remind about our disappeared children. But we do not see any positive results in uh, the search and uh, in investigation. Of course, our relatives and our friends try to support us. Uh, we are mm, uh, supported by activists, by friends and our families. Uh, and we try to keep this topic in the center of public attention. Um, but this brings uh, negligible results. Uh, our um, son, uh, our grandson, uh, uh, is now 14 years old and his voice resembles now so much the voice of his uh, father. Uh, we um, recollect our life before Russian occupation and uh, that was normal life. Our uh, children now had migrated from Crimea to Western Ukraine uh, and uh, without uh, our son Timur and with our grandson who now lives in Western Ukraine, we um, feel lonely. It is difficult for us today maintain uh, relations with our uh, relatives in Russia because we deeply suffer from disappearance of our son and we blame not only Russian government but uh, uh, Russia all Russian people in the disappearance uh, of our son. Actually, I see the whole Russia as uh, the, um, uh, the enemy uh, who ruined our lives. Uh, I would like uh, to... Uh, mm, Thing to all those uh, people uh, who uh, try to uh, assist our um, uh, grandson Mark 
uh, and uh, try to involve him in all the sorts of activities related to commemoration of his uh, father. Several years ago, uh, he participated in competition of essays about uh, uh, his father. We feel that thus we are involved. Besides that, Iskandar Bariyev, again, who is uh, uh, connected to uh, Majlis of Crimean Tatar people, um, he uh, involves our grandson into summer camps organized by Majlins. So thus he uh, got uh, involved into this circle and uh, our grandson can uh, uh, can be proud of his father. Uh, we reside in Kherson region in Ginichesk district in our village uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, 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 chairman of uh, the uh, uh, local self uh, government uh, who is not very patriotic we never can hear the uh, state hymn he uh, he uh, uh, is preoccupied with his own interests uh, uh, while he tries to uh, persecute us at least uh, uh, orally. Uh, uh, he expressed doubts that our son truly forcibly disappeared. He tried to uh, threaten me that if I do not stop to criticize him, he would uh, um, uh, he, he, he would do something bad to me. Uh, thank you, Larissa. I have to stop you. Sorry for this, but we have several presenters who would like to make interventions. Thank you for sharing your personal insights, uh, grieving insights with us. Uh, thank you for um, uh, for your. Uh, patience and thank you for your uh, strong spirit. Uh, uh, with this, I would like to give the floor to the analyst of Crimea, Sos, um, Evgeny Yaroshenko. I would ask you to take uh, up to seven minutes and uh, describe the major uh, general features in all those forced uh, disappearances. Thank you, Olga. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you for joining uh, this uh, uh, presentation. I would like to thank to all those who remain attentive to that uh, forced disappearances, which was a crime. Uh, what does it mean, forced disappearance? The disappearance, forced disappearance means uh, uh, kidnapping and uh, keeping in uh, custody of a person. Uh, uh, and uh, this kidnapping uh, and uh, custody is uh, done uh, with the permission of the official uh, authorities uh, of the state and uh, 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 thus, the kidnapped person um, remains without any legal aid. Uh, this obviously is a violation of uh, fundamental human rights uh, uh, that is violated is the right for personal freedom, the right for um, justice or just uh, uh, court uh, uh, proceedings, uh, then there is a, a high risk of uh, tortures. Uh, if I look at this 
situation in Ukraine, the first forced disappearance happened with Georgi Gangadze, but uh, many years ago. But then uh, the forced disappearances happened just occasionally. They were not of systemic nature, but from the year uh, 2014, when Russian troops had entered Crimea, the situation had changed radically. Uh, on a April 20, Rishat Ametov was kidnapped. Uh, he was a resident of Simferopol who uh, organized individual piquet uh, to uh, protest against the illegal occupation of Crimea. Uh, in several days, he was found dead. During the years of Crimean occupation, 44 people became subject to forced uh, uh, disappearances. Uh, out of them, uh, uh, seven were liberated, three uh, persons were um, uh, accused uh, as uh, um, uh, 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 six people were found dead and 15 uh, persons who disappeared remains unknown and our report is devoted to these 15 people who are those 15 people um, if we look at the waves, uh, the history of Crimean disappearances, they happened in several ways. The first uh, um, wave involved pro-Ukrainian activists like Timur Shaimardanov uh, uh, and his friends. The next waves of disappearances dealt with Crimean Tatars and their relatives. In our report, we uh, uh, have a had established uh, based on the interviews with relatives and direct and indirect witnesses that out of that 15 uh, cases of disappearances, uh, il in 11 cases we can trace back direct involvement of the state agencies and uh, uh, the, the, the organizations related to them, the Crimean self-defense, then FSB, uh, um, uh, 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 we have also the uh, proofs that uh, main uh, intelligence department of Russia had was involved. Then um, we have. Um, Evidences that the transport transport police was involved in to some cases. We have discovered at least five cases when before kidnapping, uh, the um, victims were uh, surveyed. Uh, uh, if you look at. Uh, uh, Russia and at its response to those cases, we find out that in three cases there were no criminal uh, investigations. Um, in nine cases, uh, the criminal investigations were initiated, but the investigations later were suspended and. Uh, uh, the information which we have found about all that uh, uh, 15 cases uh, proves that uh, uh, important witnesses were not uh, um, interrogated, the relatives were not interrogated, which uh, uh, brings us to conclusion that Russia, which actually controls the uh, Crimean uh, Peninsula, does uh, not uh, um, uh, comply with its obligations in the uh, human rights area. Uh, then we found out that uh, 
Uh, all the activists were intimidated by Russian authorities. Uh, besides that, Russian uh, investigative uh, authorities uh, quite often uh, uh, put forward two versions about disappearances that uh, uh, first a victim left uh, home for um, participation in some illegal participation in some military conflict. Uh, uh, this was done in six cases. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, so, so, sometimes uh, uh, the authorities suggest that there was a conflict based on commercial grounds, but uh, um, this uh, uh, usually is not well grounded or well proved. Since Crimea uh, has uh, no control over Crimean Peninsula, but nevertheless, Ukraine uh, preserves uh, its obligation to investigate these uh, cases of uh, um, forced disappearances. Um, what could be done without uh, regaining of control over Crimea? <laughs> Keeping in mind that relatives cannot travel uh, to Kiev from their places of residence, uh, and also keeping in mind that many relatives were intimidated after disappearances. Mm -mm. Uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, party could do something. Uh, for this. And uh, or, uh, also we should keep in mind that many, many evidences had disappeared after these six years. Thank you for your attention. I give the mic back to the moderator. Thank you, Evgen. You have brought us to the next topic. This is uh, how proactive are Ukrainian authorities. We have half an hour to discuss this uh, um, issue. We had invited uh, Kirilla Kapika uh, deputy head of the uh, uh, Crimean uh, prosecutor's office, then Tamila Tasha, deputy head of the presidential envoy in uh, um, Crimea, and uh, uh, Maria Tamak, coordinator of the Media Initiative for Human Rights. Uh, uh, when uh, I would now, I would ask Maria Tomac to start this panel. Your organization, Media Initiative for Human Rights, carried out uh, several um, investigations, journalist investigations. Um, oh, what does it mean, a journalist investigation, and uh, what were the results? Uh, thank you. Media initiative uh, during all these years uh, carried out several investigations in partnership with uh, civic activists, etc. Uh, in course of those investigations, uh, we uh, uh, try to identify the uh, what happened to those activists uh, who were kidnapped in Crimea. During that investigations, we uh, involved people all around Ukraine.
and uh, you in the network until the platform you may find uh, a s description of three cases Ivan Bandarets, Valery Boschuk, Timur Shermaidanov and Tigran Saimerdinov and uh, about Vasil Chernish. In uh, those uh, e journalist investigations, we we did our best what we could uh, do without uh, access to the Crimean territory. For us, who keep saying that Crimea is Ukraine, uh, it's a threat uh, to attend. Uh, to cross the Crimean border. Uh, on those report, in those reports which I mentioned, uh, some uh, uh, facts were omitted. Those were the facts which we uh, transferred directly to the law enforcement uh, system, and uh, that facts were included directly to the cases. And uh, Crimean uh, prosecutors' or, uh, office. Uh, uh, is now dealing with those cases. Also, we translated our materials and transferred that facts to the United Nations Special uh, uh, Task Force, which about um, kidnappings which visited Ukraine several years ago. Our understanding is that uh, the result would not uh, uh, come soon. Uh, we expect that at some moment in future, the fair judgment um, and fair uh, trial will be held over uh, uh, those who were involved uh, into forced kidnappings from the occupants' uh, um, side. Mm. Uh, this graph of the of so-called Russian Spring in Crimea uh, reflects the same strategy which was applied later in Donbass during this unlawful uh, occupation. Um, the activists, all people who are pro-Ukrainian. Um, uh, all those who um, stand on the side of Ukrainian army, they immediately have to be destroyed. There were some people who came to Crimea from uh, Maidan. Uh, 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 this were uh, two guys who traveled from Kiev on March 7th. They uh, arrived to Simferopol railway station. It was at the moment when that green uh, man uh, he just entered Crimea and immediately having arrived to the Simferopol railway station, they faced the um, uh, Russian Cossacks from the Crimean self-defense. Uh, which actually were illegal um, uh, military formations who participated in that uh, um, vi violent uh, actions against civic activists. Then uh, uh, Vasil Chernish, who disappeared on uh, March uh, um, 15 and uh, Timur and Selim disappeared later on at the later stage of this first uh, uh, first period of the Crimean occupation. We have several versions of what had happened. Uh, 
and in the absence of efficient investigation, we uh, uh, have no doubts that responsibility is on the mm, uh, uh, Russian authorities, uh, which uh, 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 occupied uh, the peninsula. The cases of uh, kidnapped people, they do not stand as a separate case. They are in the context of uh, uh, the whole process which took place in Crimea. First, uh, um, the illegal band formations appeared, but they were not acting in their official capacity. Later on, when the cases of Sintsov appeared, the detentions were done by, and arrests were done by official uh, law enforcement agencies. I think that we should clearly understand and present this as the whole process. When you look at the case of Shipter, who now is in the uh, penitentiary institution in Crimea, uh, this case also should be seen in the general context of this um, persecution of Ukrainian activists. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, those persons could uh, uh, be uh, figures of several um, cases at the same time. Uh, the case about kidnapping, the uh, unlawful investigation on, and persecution for political reasons, etc. The case of Rishat Ametov last summer, we published materials of our journalist investigation where we demonstrated inefficient uh, investigation uh, carried out by occupants in Crimea. And of course, the uh, those who had to be blamed, they were not even interrogated. Mm, I would mention two important aspects. We understand that families and relatives are frustrated. And keeping in mind that insufficient attention is given to this topic, I think that Ukraine may focus attention on the uh, topic of uh, forced uh, disappearances on the framework of Crimean platform. Perhaps the Ministry of Foreign Affairs should draw attention to this aspect and uh, uh, another um, answer could be sanctions. First, we should promote sanctions at the national level as to the uh, uh, persons guilty in those disappearances, perhaps not against ordinary or regular officers, but those who e initiated disappearances, and then uh, bring this topic of um, uh, uh, sanctions for uh, forced disappearances to the national level. We should keep in mind that the Magnitsky law remains uh, effective, and uh, uh, on the framework of that law, we can um, deal with the, those cases. You've mentioned cases, and I know that in our report you wrote that uh, in three cases uh, they didn't start cases in uh, the occupied Crimea. Uh, this is about Vashuk, but then Chernesh cases. And I give the floor to the representative of the prosecutor's office uh, um, of uh, Crimea, um, Kirill Kapika. Uh, in the first part of our event, Larisa Shemedanova and Abdurashid Japarov uh, were speaking, and uh, they had some concerns about investigation that uh, are ongoing in the 
territory that is controlled by Ukraine. And I would like to ask you to tell us about facts of uh, for disappearances and how these cases are considered by the prosecutor's office uh, in order to provide information to the public about these cases. So you have five to seven minutes. Good afternoon, dear audience, about statistical data about the work of the prosecutor's office work. We registered criminal cases concerning forced disappearance of 18 people and about qualification. They are qualified in accordance with Article 115, six cases about disappearance of eight people and uh, also Article 146, two cases and um, Article 136 uh, concerning six people. Several minutes ago, we've mentioned disappearance of Ivan Bandarets, Vashuk, Mr. Vashuk, Timur Shamaganova, Serena Zinedinova, Vesel Chernish, and Ervina Ragimov. At the end of 2018, a number of criminal cases concerning forced disappearances of people in the occupied territory. They were requalified by the prosecutor's office. Concerning part first, Article 438, uh, this is concerning the violation of customs uh, of war. This decision was taken because the uh, uh, prosecutor's office and the law enforcement bodies, uh, they made conclusion that uh, there is direct participation of uh, occupation bodies in these cases in persecution and their possible participation in um, uh, disappearances of uh, these persons. About the cases that were mentioned about Mr. Ametov in the criminal case, last year we identified three per per persons who directly participated in Rishat Ametov disappearance and uh, uh, charges were served and uh, now uh, we are going to start special in investigation um, and court hearing in, abs in, absentia, in absentia. And also those facts that are highlighted in the media and the materials are provided by NGOs concerning disappearance of people in the occupied, temporarily occupied territory. And the, our prosecutor's office provide assessment to these cases. And in all the cases, the criminal cases are registered and uh, pretrial investigation are ongoing. And um, about the results of investigation as of today, Rishat Ametov case, the persons are identified. In other cases, at this stage, the, we collect evidence and the scope that is possible in connection with the fact that the access to temporarily occupied territory is impossible at the moment. That's why this uh, creates obstacles for collection of evidence. And this prevents uh, the bodies of investigation to speed up the identification of possible witnesses and those who are involved in criminal violations. Thank you very much. I would like also to speak about those issues concerning legislative initiatives during this panel. And I would like to give the floor to Tamila to speak about those actions uh, um, that are carried out by the state bodies uh, concerning uh, these uh, forced disappearance cases. How do you assess this situation in the whole? Good afternoon, dear colleagues. 
this topic of forced disappearances, for me, this is really painful topic and really important topic. When I had the Crimea SOS NGO, we started to hold actions near the embassy of the Russian Federation, and we presented a report, first report in 2016. And I thank Crimea SOS that you continue to hold such actions, and also you uh, carry out actions on the internet. You carry out survey. You involve international as uh, experts and you support the families of those people who are the victims of forced disappearances. About the question you've asked, Ola, uh, about the instruments that can be used by the state concerning the violations of uh, human rights and about the access to occupied territories. This is a very difficult issue. I understand uh, that uh, a prosecutor's office and the office of the prosecutor's gen uh, general, they, of course, have many difficulties uh, in their work because of lack of access. But starting 2016, uh, prosecutor's office of Crimea started to deal with this issue, and uh, they took this case se seriously, and they um, in, enter the data into the uh, register, unified register of cases, and uh, there are some serious developments. Uh, uh, for example, Rishat Anmetov case, suspects, they were found, but at the moment there is no opportunity to d detain them. Another issue is that the state uh, speaks about forced disappearances at different international platforms, and this is done not only in the framework of Crimea platform mentioned, but Maria, and um, uh, res there are resolutions on human rights, and uh, they were uh, um, these are the resolutions of the general. Assembly, uh, you know, and uh, in these resolutions, they always mention the victims of the forced disappearances and the resolution that was adopted by the third committee. We hope that it will be voted for in December by the General Assembly, and we, ha we have hope that it will be supported by our international partners, and this is really important, and I believe that we should speak about it in more detail, and um, we hope to get information from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs concerning this issue. Another aspect that is really important to voice is the issue about activity of the Commission concerning people who went missing uh, in specific under specific circumstances. Several years ago, the law was adopted in Ukraine concerning people who went missing under specific circumstances. This is about uh, victims of forced disappearances, and uh, the public participated actively through the committee um, to help develop this uh, draft law. Unfortunately, it is difficult to estimate the reasons why it was done so, but the topic of Crimea was not included in this law, and this brings many other problems, because in the law there are many norms. One of the norms is the issue of uh, the register of people who went missing under specific circumstances. And this is about those people who went missing in the territory of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast um, during the armed conflict. And Crimea is not included. For, uh, uh, and there was a first meeting of the committee two months ago, and the political will was expressed to start uh, active actions, and uh, they should uh, 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 they should have elected the head and uh, 
um, we propose the can candidatures and we hope for changes that will be introduced into legislation and the representatives of uh, civil society, they also should be included in this commission. But at the moment, the commission doesn't work. And it is important to say that the launch of the work of this commission is really important. Last week, headed by Mr. Nemchinam, there was a meeting of the working group, including the members of this commission, and we hope that uh, in the nearest future, this process will be relaunched. There are many recommendations uh, from the Office of the President and the uh, Representative Office of the President concerning Crimea about uh, the work of this commission that is important to launch its activity and who will be the holder of this register. These issues are voiced. The state bodies of power understand this issue, but at the moment there is no resolution. And uh, I mentioned the law that was adopted and uh, amendments should be introduced into this law concerning the issues of uh, forced disappearances uh, in the territory of the occupied Crimea and the Sevastopol city. And uh, civil society, Ministry of Justice and People's Deputies, they uh, have worked on the changes uh, to this law and we hope that because of the number of problems when this commission tried to launch its activity. We hope that these changes into basic legislation, we hope that this um, topic became really acute. And the last thing I wanted to say, this is about the activity of the um, working group uh, of the commission uh, at the uh, president, you know, about the conception, uh, concept of transitional um, legislation. This is the right for truth, the issue of responsibility, and uh, also about compensation to the victims. And also, this is about reforms in order not to. Uh, repeat those violations. So this is about uh, the violation of uh, grave, uh, this is about grave violations of human rights, uh, such as forced disappearance and this right uh, to truth. And in the context of forced disappearances, uh, this right is really painful because um, many, uh, the majority of uh, relatives of victims of forced disappearances, they say that the main is to know what really happened with their loved ones, with their parents, with their children. They want to know where they are and they want to know about their condition. So this right truth, it is connected with the, also with compensation to the victims of these four disappearances, and this is really important. This is the responsibility of the state. We should understand that in the law that we hope will be, uh, that uh, the amendments will be introduced into legislation and the families uh, of uh, those who were deprived of liberty uh, because of political reasons, they uh, get, uh, sh should get compensation. And the families of uh, uh, victims of forced uh, disappearance cases, they also should be provided with compensations. And, uh, and Larissa mentioned about uh, 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 grand um, son, uh, Mark, and uh, uh, those 
who fought for Ukraine and who became victims of this conflict, they should be provided with compensation. We have, we would like to thank all NGOs who collect information about forced disappearances and they work with these issues on a systemic level and this data should be provided to the law enforcement bodies of Ukraine and also this information should be provided to the international judicial institutions and as I understand and the Ministry of Justice, we don't have representatives now, but uh, there's data about false disappearance as victims. This data should be included into inter, um, state complaints against Russian Federation in the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, also there should be separate cases uh, concerning the victims. These cases should be included into the materials that uh, are handed over to the International Criminal Court. And this is really important. These are the issues of accountability, responsibility of those who, who uh, committed these uh, grave crimes, uh, uh, grave uh, violations of human rights. Uh, thank you very much, dear participants. Uh, the second topic is discussed. And now the next topic. Before this, I would like to say about a few words about the report. And we live in the epoch of digitalization and some changes were introduced by the quarantine. And uh, you may uh, get this report uh, uh, through QR code and uh, this will be brought in onto the screen after our presentation. And we have this report in uh, Ukrainian, English, and Russian, and uh, uh, we have this uh, in the Crimea SOS um, site and the UCMC site. There will be also uh, this report will be also presented in English on the site. Uh, so please. Uh, you may download it, you may read this report, you may ask speak, uh, speakers, and we will have a Zoom connection until the end of our uh, meeting. And uh, I will voice your questions to the speakers. As a lawyer of NGO, I thank Tamila for mentioning this law concerning uh, people who went missing. We uh, reflected it in our report at the stage of development of this draft, draft law. Crimea disappeared from the document technically because there were minor changes to the law. And this will provide the opportunity and will provide protection to the family members uh, of victims of forced disappearances. When we prepared this report, we communicated with the families and, uh, and they said about the necessity to um, have the support of the state, not only the start of uh, the criminal cases, but also there should be proper attitude to these people. And we reflected it uh, in the uh, draft law. And this would be the biggest support from the side of the state. I would like to start the third part of our meeting. What does the international community do to prevent such crimes and to increase responsibility for forced disappearances? We have such participants, Anastasia Donetsk, analyst of Crimea SOS. She is co-author of this report and the expert in international law, Irina Samchenka, deputy head of the main department of analysis and planning, head of the department of uh, foreign policy initiative of political directorate of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Simon Papashvili, program director of the organization International Partnership for Human Rights, and Alex Prezanti, expert of international, in international law. I greet everyone, you all participants uh, who work with us through Zoom, and uh, I will give you the floor. I would like to ask you to voice this international res um, responsibility and responsibility for these forced disappearances. 
um, what responsibility is envisaged by international law and uh, um, how can we bring uh, the Russian Federation to justice for these forced disappearances and uh, do we have prospects to bring some uh, people to individual responsibility? I mean, those people who were identified by the investigation as those who committed these crimes. Um, so I give the floor to Anastasia Danets. I would like to remind you that our time limits are up to seven minutes for each intervention. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would like to remind you what is already done, and then my colleagues will add what what is being being done. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to remind you that uh, the uh, state uh, sovereignty uh, that R Russia Russia keeps saying that the state uh, sovereignty may allows them to do what they wish as to the um, a, so to say educating its citizens in Crimea. Uh, fortunately, some dozen is years ago, international community came to conclusion that uh, uh, re-education or um, reconvention of citizens uh, um, uh, should not be done by the state and uh, um, uh, that in extreme cases uh, this should be considered c crime and uh, uh, then uh, forced disappearances are considered by, as crimes by international uh, law. Mm, this is uh, reflected in the uh, conven UN Convention mm, and uh, the responsibility of the states in terms of prevention of forced uh, um, disappearances uh, is clearly reflected again in international legislation and the consequence of non-compliance with it results in bringing the states to responsibility and uh, un uh, but unlike uh, national law the international law um, uh, could be enforced uh, or uh, only indirectly that is uh, why uh, the in uh, the un committee on forced disappearances for example it uh, may only uh, uh, accept reports from the states uh, and produce uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, then the next uh, fact is that Russia is not uh, um, a party to signing party of that convention about uh, uh, forced disappearances. Uh, mm. At the same time, there is international task force uh, about uh, uh, forced disappearances. Uh, this is uh, the tool of uh, soft uh, uh, power, and uh, it can make soft pressure on the Russian Federation. Uh, 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 e since the um, disappearances uh, happened in the territory controlled by Russia, Russia is obliged to provide information to the relatives about investigations. But unfortunately, this group has no uh, tools to force Russia to make that investigations effective. Also, there is a European uh, Court on Human Rights in National Criminal Court. Uh, the decisions of those courts are of uh, bounding nature, mm, uh, but uh, their forced disappearances are not directly prohibited by the uh, European uh, Convention on Human Rights. And uh, um, Nevertheless, uh, forced disappearance uh, is a, 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 a 
complex crime. It violates uh, several human rights uh, uh, at the same time. Um, Besides that, uh, it was mentioned today that Ukraine applied to the European Court on Human Rights in several cases as to the forced disappearances, as to kidnappings. There were uh, a lot of individual applications uh, about disappearances. Uh, um, uh, applied uh, by by Crimean res residents. Um, with this, I uh, will shift to the International Criminal Court and its role. For its disappearances, when they have a multiple nature, systemic nature, they are considered to be the crimes against humanity and uh, thus they fall within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. We have uh, registered 44 cases of uh, um, forced disappearances maybe not this is not exhaustive list uh, in some 50 cases we have proofs of direct involvement of Russian forces into those disappearances. Thus it uh, falls within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Uh, if the state uh, has no capacity like Ukraine to investigate properly such cases or does not wishes like this is in the case with Russia which preserves control over the territory but is not willing to investigate then the criminal court can uh, carry out investigation uh, neither Ukraine nor Russia uh, are not permanent men members of the uh, or signatory parties of the criminal court but Ukraine applied for ad hoc investigation and uh, the judge of the criminal court found grounds to uh, uh, consider those disappearances as the uh, crimes against humanity and uh, uh, to persecute uh, uh, some uh, persons who might be recognized as guilty in those uh, disappearances and accused in them. Uh, currently, the um, materials is uh, been been collected uh, um, for submission to the International Criminal Court. Uh, but the majority of experts believe that uh, uh, it will take years uh, to uh, come to some uh, to produce some judgment. Uh, in the meanwhile, Ukraine may try to apply diplomatic means and diplomatic tools. Uh, uh, thus, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs can do its move. Uh, some uh, uh, resolutions of uh, uh, international organizations might be passed. Uh, Mm -hmm. This might be declarations made on behalf of some states. There might be um, sanctions against uh, specific persons who violated international law or the human rights in Crimea. So this, that's it with my intervention. Thank you, Anastasia. I would like to invite to the microphone representative from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ms. Irina Samchenka. Irina, would you describe the work of your ministry? Uh, 
um, related to, to uh, that kidnappings uh, and uh, what is the attitude towards the situation with the kidnappings at the international arena, so to say. What is the response from our international partners? Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank to the organizers uh, for invitation, and I would like to thank for the research which is published today. Mm, as many speakers had uh, mentioned, uh, the kidnappings should be considerably kept in the focus of uh, uh, public attention, and our ministry tries to uh, mm, uh, keep this focus at the international arena. This is a actually the partially the answer to your question all the time in our contacts with partners at all levels we bring this issue to the attention of those partners and try to preserve this item in the as the item of the agenda uh, the third committee of united nations had passed a resolution about human rights situation in crimea Mm-hmm. Uh, this was uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Tamila Tasheva, and uh, I will describe more about uh, this uh, year's uh, uh, document, the practice of passage of passing a Crimean resolutions uh, has been in practice since uh, mm, uh, 2016, and each year we amend those resolutions with new facts. Uh, the uh, draft for this year would f uh, draw attention to the uh, uh, unlawfulness of uh, 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 uh Russian authorities and uh, their action in Crimea including uh, uh, law enforcement agencies uh, also the uh, international humanitarian law aspects uh, will be uh, uh, underscored then the pandemic Russia um, introduces additional um, restrictive measures uh, under pretext of pandemic then in in a adequate response of Russian state uh, to the pandemic threats in Crimea. Then the issue of, of uh, assimilation of young people uh, in Crimea. For the first time, uh, Russia had prevented young uh, people to the access to Ukrainian uh, legis, uh, Ukrainian uh, education. Uh, also, we had uh, mentioned several proper names like Selim Mustafaev. Uh, uh, this uh, effect. Uh, when we introduce uh, some personal names into the resolution allows us to uh, fight uh, for the liberation of those people. Then uh, one of the aspects of resolution is devoted to um, accusations in espionage and uh, um, uh, spying. Also, we uh, uh, brought to focus uh, the tortures and persecution for um, uh, in agreement to serve in Russian army and persecution of Crimean Tatars uh, from the year 2016. Uh, all the Crimean resolutions condemn uh, kidnappings in the peninsula and uh, um, uh, the fact that they uh, re that there is impunity for those who are guilty. 
the access of the ECE mission or UN missions uh, might be a partial solution to that, but uh, uh, this is not allowed. As the occupant state, Russia uh, should uh, allow those missions. Uh, uh, the resolution uh, also uh, encourages international community to take joint action against Russia and make pressure upon it uh, uh, and to promote uh, international mechanism for liberation of Crimea and the Crimean platform. Uh, Crimean pla in Crimean platform, we d will devote a big uh, section to the human rights and liberation of all those who are persecuted. We are now shaping the international network. Uh, uh, it will comprise Ukrainian and international uh, uh, experts. We will work at the level of the heads of the states, the ministries of foreign uh, uh, affairs, uh, then the experts level. Now, uh, coming back to the resolution of the uh, UN Assembly. On December 16, it will be reviewed and voted in the UN. Uh, another ex, uh, another um, aspect how we can draw attention uh, was uh, the October um, uh, uh, report uh, of the UN uh, Assembly Chairman about uh, a situation in Crimea. The, in that uh, report, he encouraged and called for Russia to investigate the um, uh, 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 forced disappearances. In September last year, a special report of the task force on uh, uh, kidnappings uh, for political reasons in Geneva was uh, published recently. And uh, uh, during its last mission, they uh, mm, produced a special resolution. Besides uh, the UN resolution, uh, uh, we have several resolutions of the European Parliament about uh, um, the need to investigate uh, of, uh, unlawful disappearances. Uh, then uh, I would like to discuss the issue of the International Cuma, uh, Criminal Court and uh, International uh, um, Human Rights Court. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs in uh, January 2017 applied to the International Court of Human Rights and the International Court had uh, confirmed its jurisdiction over that case. Ukraine had proved documentally that in the occupied Crimea, Russian uh, uh, follows the, the policy of uh, uh, um, genocide uh, or persecution of Crimean Tatars, uh, the Rishad Ahmed of Timoshina Danov and other Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians. Uh, um, Russia is obliged to produce its counter memorandum by uh, uh, April 8th, 2021, and respond uh, to uh, the um, facts, blaming facts uh, uh, submitted by Ukraine. We try to uh, encourage international sanctions against Russia. In December, in the European Union, we expect voting for the new sanctions for violation of human rights. Uh, 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 for more than a year, we have been working without, uh, with our EU partners on this new mechanism. Um, 
uh, we also uh, uh, work in the uh, group which has consultations as to legal consequences uh, for a violation of human rights in Crimea. I prepared a lot of questions to you, but it seems to me that you had answered uh, all, almost all of them. But there is one uh, big uh, issue for all Ukrainians about uh, responsibility. Uh, eventual uh, responsibility. That's why I will give the floor now to Simon Paposhvili, Program Director of the Organization International Partnership for Human Rights. And my question to Simon is uh, uh, whether we do know the um, cases when such things were punished because I'm looking at it. But somehow I hear the interpreter's voice. Which, yeah, now it should be okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, my Ukrainian is not up to, up to speed, uh, but surprisingly I was able to follow your conversations in Ukrainian and understand most, most of what you have said. Um, well, I would, I would talk a little bit about the state responsibility and Alex will talk about uh, the individual responsibility. Uh, I work for an international organization called International Partnership for Human Rights uh, and we have been engaged in documenting human rights violations and international crimes in Crimea since uh, uh, March, pretty much 2014. So since this crisis unfolded and since uh, Green Men appeared first uh, uh, on Crimea. And we, in this period, we have uh, gathered quite a substantial uh, body of evidence showing different types of violations and enforced disappearances is indeed one of those types of violations. And yeah, one of the things that we are trying to do is to facilitate access to justice uh, for the families of the victims. And to that end, uh, we try to support lawyers, uh, Crimean lawyers who are working with the uh, family members of the disappeared persons. And one of the uh, strategies that we use to, to facilitate access to justice is to uh, help the victims uh, and their families to bring cases to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, as uh, previous speakers have already explained, this court has uh, jurisdiction over what's going on in Crimea. Crimea is obviously uh, Ukraine uh, and is currently co controlled under uh, by the Russian Federation, which is exercising effective control, therefore uh, responsibility to all violations which occur on Crimean Peninsula lies uh, in, in the Russian Federation, uh, or is a responsibility of the Russian Federation. Uh, well, maybe I start by just outlining why would, first of all, victims want to take cases, or why would NGOs want to help victims to take cases to the European Courts of Human Rights. Well, uh, there are a number of reasons why this is done, including by us uh, and why we, we are pursuing this pass. Uh, first of all, we would like these cases to be properly investigated. Uh, European Court is not, not an investigative body. This being said, European Court does gather evidence in cases that it is handling. And sometimes the European Court can even organize uh, uh, limited uh, investigative uh, visits uh, to the countries. This is done very rarely, but it, it is a possibility. In any case, the court is gathering uh, quite substantial evidence, including from us and including from the lawyers who are representing the victims. So we are accumulating this uh, evidence through this uh, judicial uh, body. Second purpose why we are doing this is to seek the recognition of the violation of the rights of uh, Enforced, forcefully disappeared persons and, and their family members. And thirdly, we would like to seek compensation uh, on behalf of the victims. Uh, now, legitimate question that we often ask ourselves uh, is, uh, 
does is it even worse to spend uh, time uh, on this mechanism? And and to answer that question, we need to look into how Russia really respects uh, and reacts to the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, well, there have been more than 120 judgments already delivered by the European Court of Human Rights, where the court has found uh, violations in cases concerning uh, enforced disappearance in Russia. These cases mostly have happened in the uh, North Caucasus republics, mostly in Chechnya, but also in other other um, other nor northern North Caucasian republics. A uh, couple of uh, exemplary cases that I could uh, name would be Turlieva uh, versus Russia and uh, uh, Al Sahanova and uh, others versus, versus Russia. Uh, in in uh, Turlieva case, which was brought by the mother of uh, the disappeared person, the case concerned the uh, disappearance of Saikh, uh, Saleh Ibrahimov, who was a young man who was detained by the police uh, in, in Grozny, in Chechen capital, and was last seen uh, in the police station. And uh, no whereabouts were known about this person after he was last seen in, in that uh, police station. Uh, courts found a number of violations in this case, including right to life on account of presumed death of uh, Mr. Ibrahimov, as well as on account to, of, of the state's failure to protect his life and on account of failure to conduct effective investigation into his disappearance. So that's all Article 2 of the Convention on or Right to Life. Court also found violation of Article 3 uh, on account of uh, mother, uh, Ms. Turuyeva's uh, suffering, resulting from the, her inability to find out uh, about what happened to her son after uh, he was arrested by the police. And the courts also found violation of Article 5 um, on, a, on account of sites uh, Ibrahimov's unlawful detention and violation of Article 13 uh, on account of non-availability non of the effective remedies for the victim uh, and for uh, her family. And these are like, this is a typical set of violations that the European Courts of Human Rights uh, finds to have been violated. Uh, in cases that concern disappearances. Um, well, you will be surprised that Russia diligently pays compensation uh, as a form of just satisfaction to the victims' families in those cases. So victims are not only able to have the, their rights violations recognized, but in most of the cases they are also able to uh, get monetary compensation for, for huge suffering that they are exposed to. But the problem lies in Russia's inability to address the structural problems um, that had been identified by these over 120 cases. And the, the European courts, uh, in those judgments, outlined two structural measures which Russia had to implement. One of them is uh, actually relates to alleviation of the continuous suffering by, by the families of the victims who have disappeared. And that could include complex set of measures, uh, including uh, financial assistance, social assistance, psychological assistance, etc., to the family members. But most importantly, uh, another structural uh, deficiency that Russia has found out in those cases relate to the uh, structural deficiencies uh, in the criminal proceedings that concern investigation uh, of uh, the allegations of the disappearances that uh, had been made in those cases. So these two big structural problems remain, and they are also unfortunately common uh, in Crimean cases that we have seen and that we have documented. So, um, so we see that neither uh, family members of the victims receive any sort of support from the Russian state, nor Russian state is co conducting any sort of effective investigation into those allegations. Uh, so on the one hand, this instrument could be an important tool for having uh, violations of the rights of the family members of the disappeared persons recognized. They could also potentially uh, claim compensation from the Russian state for uh, the suffering that they have experienced, but 
uh, this court uh, and this instrument has its limits uh, when it comes to preventing further similar types of violations from happening. Um, and yeah, the part of the reason why this happens is because when we talk about state responsibility, it, it very often gets diluted. It gets diluted in the way that no individual, no individuals involved in uh, enforced disappearances are uh, held accountable for their involvement into this heinous crime, and compensation, which is paid to the uh, families of the victims often also comes, not often, always comes from from the taxpayers' money, it comes from the budget. So again, perpetrators go unpunished and uh, it's, uh, it's the Russian, usually ordinary Russians who had to uh, bear uh, the responsibility by, you know, for financial burden essentially, um, because uh, the Russian government does not do what it has to do in order to prevent such kind of violations. And that's where the concept of individual responsibility uh, comes into play, uh, and that's another area of work which we're uh, pursuing, and I, I let Alex to talk about it more. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, great. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. This is um, a pleasure and an honor, as always. Um, my name is Alex Brizanti. I'm a partner at Global Diligence LLP, uh, a UK-based law firm. And, um, I specialize in international crime and um, human rights, international human rights litigation. And so, whereas Simon spoke about state responsibility, I will speak about individual criminal responsibility. And the big difference between them is that um, when it comes to human rights violations, you usually have to demonstrate um, that uh, the state has failed to respect or protect um, a particular human right, whereas in the case of in individual criminal responsibility, this requires the identification of an individual or a group of individuals who might be responsible for um, the violation, in this case, enforced disappearance, which in international law is defined as an abduction or detention with the intent to remove a person from the protection of the law for a prolonged period of time. And just before I go into what that actually uh, means and how, how it's done at the national and international level, the first thing to note is that individual criminal responsibility requires something which uh, is commonly known as linkage evidence. And this is, this is very important because this is what makes or breaks uh, a criminal case. And it's probably the most challenging aspect of, 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 of bringing such cases. Linkage evidence is evidence that links uh, this individual or a group of individuals to the act itself. So in the case of enforced disappearances, this would be um, evidence of abduction and evidence of responsibility for that abduction. So, um, for example, a, a video of, of, of somebody actually participating in, in the abduction of a person or, um, uh, or, or, or witness statement to the effect that somebody uh, had participated but also um, evidence of responsibility, for example, some, somebody who's in charge of a force or a unit or a group that conducted the abduction or detention, and, um, uh, and then uh, evidence that somebody withheld information from family members and loved ones about the fate or whereabouts of the abducted person. So when it comes to criminal prosecutions when it comes to individual criminal responsibility uh, you can do it on two levels the national level and the international level on the national level um, of course you have the convention the 2006 convention on enforced disappearances which um, which uh, establishes in article 4 a requirement for all states to take all necessary steps to criminalize uh, the offense uh, or the crime of enforced disappearances. And you also have Article 12 of the same convention, which requires all states 
uh, state parties to fully investigate the allegations. So, in theory, each state which has signed and ratified the convention, and I believe there are now 60 of such states, um, 62, 62 uh, states that have uh, signed and ratified the convention, each one of those states has an obligation to make enforced disappearance a crime under their criminal code or criminal uh, legislation. And uh, has an obligation to, uh, to investigate. Uh, moreover, Articles 9 and Article 11 of the Convention require each state to either prosecute or extradite any individual on their territory who is suspected of the crime of enforced disappearance. Uh, and this is where um, this is where we have uh, uh, the principle of extra extraterritorial jurisdiction. For me. Well, let me explain what that means. Normally, a court in any given country will have the right to try an individual that has committed a crime, uh, either because the crime was committed on the territory of that country, or because the um, person responsible was a national of that country. But when you have an obligation, such as an obliga obligation under Article 11 and Article 9, to either prosecute or extradite, this creates another layer of, of responsibility for the country, which is to um, put in place a framework to be able to uh, investigate, prosecute, and try individuals who have no link to the jurisdiction. And this is known as universal jurisdiction principle. Um, now, the uptake of universal jurisdiction hasn't been universal, <laughs> as it were. Uh, there are countries uh, which are particularly progressive in this area, um, such as Germany, um, the Netherlands, France, uh, Scandinavian countries, to a certain extent the UK. Uh, and then there are all the other countries that have not um, taken this on board. And even in those countries where, like Germany, where universal jurisdiction does exist in law, in practice, there are still some limitations to universal jurisdiction. Uh, so some kind of link is still required. For example, um, a suspect, evidence that a suspect either resides on the territory of that country or is about to come visit the territory of that country. Or um, in many cases, that the fact that victims uh, reside on the territory of that country, or are able to come and testify in court, or that evidence is uh, accessible to investigators in that country. Um, and you should also note that even though all these countries have the power to investigate and prosecute. Uh, universe, uh, enforced disappearances as, as a universal jurisdiction crime. Unfortunately, in most cases, enforced disappearance is defined as a crime, a crime against humanity rather than a crime in, uh, uh, in and of itself. And why I say unfortunately is because a crime against humanity has this extra layer that you need to demonstrate which is that it's not a single enforced disappearance, it's not a couple of enforced disappearance, but it is part of an attack on the civilian population, which is both widespread, which is either widespread or systematic. So in practice, it requires a kind of systematic practice, um, uh, the kind that, uh, you know, that, 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 that participants in the conference I hear have been talking about uh, is taking place in Crimea. The other option is to uh, investigate and prosecute in domestic courts um, such, practice, such conduct under the crime of torture, because there is some jurisprudence in international law that defines um, enforced disappearances uh, as acts of torture or other uh, cruel and inhuman uh, acts and treatment. And uh, torture does not have to have the full elements of crimes against humanity, torture can, you know, a single torture, a single act of torture uh, can be uh, tried under the principle of universal jurisdiction. And finally, the International Criminal Court. Um, well, the International Criminal Court 
does actually um, define and uh, criminalize enforced disappearances in Article 7.1i. However, again, it's defined as a crime against humanity, so it requires, again, an attack, um, widespread or systematic attack on, on the civilian population. Uh, it may also qualify as various uh, war crimes, such as unlawful confinement, torture, cruel and human treatment. Um, and uh, from what I understand from the um, preliminary, preliminary examination reports of the International Criminal Court, uh, the International Criminal Court is looking at enforced disappearances in, uh, on the Crimean Peninsula as part of its situation in Ukraine, which uh, will be, if I'm not mistaken, the first time that the ICC will seriously consider uh, prosecuting the crime of uh, enforced disappearance as a crime against humanity. And um, the ICC, though, is, of course, uh, as you all by now know, uh, not the panacea that we all had hoped that it would be in terms of international prosecuting international crimes. It has limited resources. Um, it's very slow. It only tackles the top perpetrators uh, if it can get its hands on those perpetrators. And so, in my view, the uh, focus should really be on um, national criminal prosecutions and investigations uh, in Ukraine and in other countries that uh, have um, some kind of jurisdictional link or under the principle of universal jurisdiction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much to our partners, to our experts in international law. We reserved some time for questions and answers, uh, but uh, my colleagues inform me that there is no further question. There are eight minutes left, and perhaps I will take the floor to summarize uh, this event. If participants wish to add some words, I would uh, like to give them the floor. If you wish to ha um, to read the report, uh, we will now have the QR code. Uh, Our organization prepared uh, this report, and uh, we um, uh, really contributed many efforts to it. We communicated with the relatives of uh, forced disappearance crimes, uh, with lawyers, human rights defenders, international experts who helped us in preparation of information. We are really grateful to them for this. As uh, today we um, have these people with us and uh, they provided advice and provided moral support to us in our aspiration to bring information and truth about forced disappearances. Today, uh, we had representatives of state bodies of power, representatives of law enforcement bodies. They told us about uh, investigations that are ongoing concerning facts of forced disappearances, I believe that there is one aspect that is outside the scope of our attention. Uh, we do not have representatives of uh, occupation power. Maybe it would be great to ask them about uh, investigations that they have there. And uh, we prepared this event, uh, and um, we prepared our report, and we understood that uh, these investigations uh, are not done. And criminal cases that were started, then they are closed or suspended. They are open for several months, and they, then they uh, are stopped, and they cannot be closed because uh, the persons were not identified, uh, and uh, the case remains uh, suspended. And then the lawyer or the member of the family files complaint, and then the 
case is restarted and then it is stopped once again or suspended. Also, we spoke about international qualification concerning these facts. We spoke about uh, aspects and circumstances that may create obstacles in investigation or preparation of complaints. Uh, and I would like to say on behalf of our organizations, we are one of the first who prepared materials uh, for the working groups concerning um, forced uh, disappearances. We prepared the uh, case of Irvina Bergagimov for UNO, um, and uh, we had cooperation with the Ukrainian Helsinki group, and also we submitted the complaint to the um, European Court on Human Rights concerning Mr. Ibrahimov case, and also uh, we will continue our work and we will remind constantly about the facts of forced disappearances, that these facts uh, uh, should not uh, remain uh, um, in this impunity and uh, we hope that we will get information about what happened and uh, uh, perpetrators will be brought to responsibility, both uh, those who executed those cra crimes and the Russian Federation as the occupant state in the Crimean Peninsula. We have uh, four minutes. If you would like to add something, please, you may do this. Uh, if there are no contributions, so I would like to ask uh, UCMC, I would like to thank UCMC on all those who organized this meeting. And uh, now you see the QR code on the screen. You may um, have the access to the report. It will be in English uh, in the nearest future. Now we have it in Ukrainian and in Russian. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is really important for us. We thank the speakers. We uh, would like to say goodbye to you. Have a nice day.